Oh my goodness. Wow. I feel like we know who should be emceeing next year. Uh, <laughs> and with that, we will move on to our next speaker, uh, which is a recorded video from Ivy Melinda, which is appropriate given that, uh, you know, I believe that Gra mentioned Ivy and her work. Uh, Ivy's 35 year old first time community. Hello, I'm Ivy Melinda. I've been the community manager for Caves of Kud since May 2018. I've seen the Discord server grow from around a half dozen people to over 3,000 between then and now. I find conceptualizing what I do as management to be officious and overselling my actual role, which is that of care and cultivation. With this talk, I intend to show how games create room for players to create their own narratives, how the communities that form around games can have profound impacts on people using myself as an example. And finally, the third part of my talk is going to hopefully illustrate some ways that community, narrative, and growth can all intertwine to form something lasting and meaningful. Also, it'll be a series of slides containing fan creations above and beyond the fan creations that I've interspersed in parts one and two. This talk is intended to demonstrate rather than instruct, as there is no real one-size-fits-all recipe for a healthy community. But let's look at the ingredients. I want to lay out the foundation of what I want to talk about by first talking about how Caves of Could provides room to be much, much more than a purely mechanical experience. I'm sure since you're here, you know at least a little bit about Caves of Kud, so I'm going to only briefly touch on some of the basic elements of the game. The first one is proc gen history. If you've played Dwarf Fortress, you probably already know all about how proc gen history uh, can leave room to um, for, for players to create their own stories. Um, there are a few very famous uh, Let's Plays along those lines. But to break it down even further, essentially what procedurally generated history is, is uh, it's, it's a narrative built from uh, jigsaw pieces selected from a bag blindly and crammed together in the hope of uh, creating a coherent narrative. In Caves of Kud, it's the Sultan, Sultan histories. Uh, and you can find uh, statues around that talk about how, for example, uh, Iridoxes II may have uh, driven their carriage off, of, uh, off the road and was saved at the last minute by a band of worms and was forever indebted to them. The second thing that Kud has to offer is florid prose. Caves of Kud is just the purplest prose that I have ever seen. And on top of that, I think it's the most, uh, it's, it's, it's very attentive, it's descriptive, it's evocative, it's well-written, and it is written with care. Um... Jason cares a lot about this game, and he has poured his soul into the writing, and it really shows. There's a lovingly depicted and diverse cast. You can see them scattered all throughout Kud. There are a series of safe places that you can go to to hang out with the characters and not worry about uh, who's going to attack you next, for the most part. <laughs> but having these characters depicted as they are is, I feel, paramount to uh, creating a, um, a world that feels real and alive. And finally, we have the game systems themselves. Combat, inventory management, faction reputation, 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These systems, uh, these systems are narratives in and of themselves, whether you want them to be or not. I believe you have to take that into account. In Jason's Nariscope 2020 talk, he talks about Caves of Kud, and he talks about the difficulties he explored um, in the process of being taught by Caves of Kud directly that systems tell stories. He describes Caves of Kud uh, in the beginning uh, as a sort of naive implementation of traditional roguelike heritage resulting in what he refers to in his talk as a combat gravity well. Because of that narrative gravity of combat, he realized the Kud experience was somewhat more gleefully bloodthirsty than he had intended, and so he had to painstakingly work around the system, systems and structures he had built in order to be able to tell more robust stories. The simulationist aspect of Caves of Kud also gives us unintended details about the world that require suspension of disbelief, but the narrative nevertheless remains. Over here we have um, the example that I provided is, how long is a Kud day? How long is a Kud turn? If we assume that the Kud day is 24 hours like our Earth, then the 1,200 turns count up to be 72 seconds long. If we assume that the turns are the standard 6-second Dungeons & Dragons turns, then every day in Kud is 2 hours long. As you can see, some suspension of disbelief is required. Suspension... Uh, sorry. The uh, n Narratives that are built by simulation tend to run into narratives that are written by hand um, in sometimes hilarious ways. All these things can inform the player experience in ways that, when reflected off the community, can be quite surprising and even lead to seeing a reflection of the game that you like more than what you had originally written. With the combination of systems, static proc gen, and emergent narratives at play, Every game of Caves of Kud builds a slightly different universe each time it gets played, leaving each player with mildly to wildly different perspectives on various aspects of the game's narrative. These interpretations exert gravity on the game in various ways, and the space where these interpretations don't overlap tend to be the most fertile ground for telling your own story. Fans and Freehold associates alike create mods, art, fiction, and other things that expand the very boundaries of Caves of Kud as a narrative experience. And that too has influenced the progress of Caves of Kud as a game itself. It creates a sort of social ecology that provides a feedback cycle, which fosters growth and bears fruit for all, all involved. What sort of fruit is your game bearing? So, I'm gonna basically tell a story all throughout part two. When I was 16, I used to go to the Long's drugstore around the corner. They had these wire racks used for holding dime store novels and postcards. I'd go there and get $5 shareware floppies of games to try out when I was bored. Eventually that phase died out, and I got my hands on a 500 shareware game CD, which had all games listed in alphabetical order. I don't remember what games came before Ancient Domains of Mystery, but I got hooked on that like nobody's business. Didn't take long for me to start looking online for help with the game. Because, you know, it's that sort of roguelike. <laughs> I almost immediately found an IRC channel about the game and, and found that I enjoyed spending my time there, so I decided to stick around. 
And from there, they introduced me to the news group, the ADOM guidebook, and also gave me personal guidance to help me through the game. Very little of it actually allowed me to complete a single playthrough of the game, but by then I had found that wasn't what I kept coming back to that space for. <clears throat> I discovered they had a meetup every year. And so when I graduated high school, my parents asked me what I wanted as a graduation gift. I told them I wanted round trip tickets to Amsterdam and I got them. It was there that I met all of those people who I had formed meaningful personal connections with, that I had grown to know, watched me grow and change as I got older, and were happy to have me at their meet. That was the first time I met Thomas Biscup, the creator of Adam. Hi, Tom. We met him as he landed, uh, flying from Germany, and then took him back to the flat that we were holed up in for the two weeks we were staying there. He showed us some very preliminary work on Jade and gave us some secrets to the source code of Adam itself. It was something like 14 years later on another continent after my transition that I next met Thomas Biscop at one of the previous roguelike cons. He remembered me. My experience with engaging with that community was so positive and affecting that it had long lasting effects on the course of my life. I began getting into other indie games and trying to engage with their communities, their creators. I had my ups and downs during all that, but it was always worth it. I would find myself going to events and trade shows like GDC, Indiecade, and stuff like that. I had even stuck, snuck into E3 once and got kicked out once they found me out. I got in in the first place because my brother was serving as a booth babe for one of the hardware vendors there. It was the year that they were exhibiting beta for Deus Ex before that game came out, a long time ago. And so even though I wasn't a part of the industry, I still wanted to engage with it as much as I could. I found out about Caves of Could in January 2017. I was playing the very, very old free version, the one that didn't have any sound, no color schemes to speak of, and... I'm pretty sure it wasn't even built in Unity yet. And yet, I still loved it enough to get to Gridgate and to want to find a place to talk about it. Brian, Brian Bucklew is the other half of Freehold Games originally, and <clears throat> he provided me with a code in short order. I took it and proceeded to have a blast with a full version of the game, such as it was back then. Fast forward about a year. GDC is happening, and I'm attending it ticketless, as is my want. I would go to Yerba Buena Gardens every March during GDC just to meet distant friends and maybe get to know some new interesting people. They would have an anti-con there every year called Lost Levels right there in Yerba Buena Park. The deal with GDC is that tickets to that place are expensive. Um, you usually only have a ticket to that place if you uh, belong to a corporation or are of means yourself. And a lot of people didn't fit into either of those categories, but still wanted to, you know, like make industry connections and, um, you know, do all of the like ancillary fun stuff that happens at places like GDC. So I saw Jason on Twitter saying that he was going to take lunch in the garden and wanted to know if anyone else would like to meet up. I took him up on the offer and we met up. We talked about systems and the history described in Could and the sort of uh, forceful nature of narratives when it comes to video game systems. We hit it off pretty well and found out that we lived near each other and became friends. It wasn't long before that that he had approached me and asked me about moderating the fresh new Caves of Could Discord. At the time, there were only a handful of people in there, so it wasn't a huge ask. I was still honored, so I took the position. He eventually started paying me a stipend to moderate the server. I want to say, like, uh, at about 250 people or so in the server. As the server grew, I grew into my role as community manager as well. I started organizing an official wiki, 
gathered a crew to assemb assemble and populate it. I started appointing volunteer mayors. Uh, that is uh, our word for uh, moderation staff. We got a Patreon set up. I continually shield the game throughout this process. Now I'm in charge of that. The wiki team, the subreddit, I use Twitter and other discords to do a lot of promotion for the game. As far as contributions go, I haven't got a whole lot compared to the rest of the gang, but the latest mutation update that dropped last Monday is wrapped around a document I spent the better part of a year hashing out. And so now I'm here giving this talk, earning a salary that's enough to sustain me, and I like that I can trace a direct line from this point all the way back to the beginning, that moment I first booted up Adam and died to a pack of jackals in the wilderness. I stand before you as a living example of the profound effects community can have on a person. That direct line between Adam and Caves of Could did this for me. What is your game doing for its community? So Carbide Chef is a four-part fanfic series by Ava Problems that crosses the concept of Iron Chef with the setting of Could. The first part was written in anticipation of 2017's cooking revamp, and it's, it's why the ultimate cooking skill is called Carbide Chef. The challenger, Agate Severance Star, was added to the game blueprints and given an in-game book by Dev Kaylin Sandal when she added her hindrance to the game. Sometimes when you start a new world, you can get a quote from her match in part one. So at the time, Hindren were a fan creation of Kalen's. This is an example of how the community builds on itself and has the capability to leapfrog from fan work to canon. It was the strength of Kalen's writing. Uh, she managed to capture the voice of Kud like Jason never thought anyone would. And so, well, he uh, he offered her a position, and she's with us now and is not going anywhere. We love her. <clears throat> the Mopango, like the Hindren, started as one of Dev Kalen's favorite early builds, iterating on survivability and specializing in crafting. After discussions between her and Jason about creating a settlement within the tomb, they agreed that the Mopango were a convenient species to inhabit such a cramped and dangerous place. Their subterranean nature and gentle faith made them an easy thematic fit for the Tomb of the Eaters. In Kaylin's words, it was a pretty small narrative leap to get from the basic Mopango build to their theme as a concept. Since I went to a Quaker school, I could recognize friends when I saw them. That's how they ended up with their pseudo-Elizabethan speech. The parallel between the Quaker inner light, light manipulation, and the cassifescence was right there, and I just had to tie the string be between the pins. And for the rest of my time, I have some nice fan art to leave you with. Here's a Dromad Trader by Cassandra Lepin. It is a lovely day in Joppa, and you are a horrible goose. This is a mod for the game made by Nalathni Dragon, aka N. McCoy. To the right is one of the earlier pieces of fan art we've gotten, and one of my personal favorites, also by Cassandra Lappin. We get cartographic impressions of the world of Kud from time to time, which is nice because Caves of Kud originally started as a setting and campaign for Tabletop and eventually made its way here. I appreciate the poetry of bringing it full circle. Eventually we hope to uh, release a system agnostic campaign module for Caves of Could tabletop settings.
but we're really busy, so we'll see what happens. So Build Club was a server activity that ran for a few months after the Proc Gen Villages update. Anyone could provide a character code, seed, and starting village. We had a bunch of different people building different characters and taking them different directions to tell different stories. It was a lot of fun, and as you can see here, we ended up with some breathtaking fan art of even these characters. It also revealed some issues we had with world seeding. And this... This is the bazaar at the foot of Tall Stethy. Tall Stethy is a structure that's been built by Discord user Cloud of Neutron Flux in the Hearthpyre mod. The Hearthpyre mod is a mod that adds homesteading and construction capabilities to the player character. It adds loot, tiles, furniture, structural objects, customizability of color, even items and equipment to facilitate large-scale building projects such as the one you see before you. And it does all this diegetically from the perspective of the character. I believe that Caves of Kud is a much more honest experience when given the ability to build yourself a home, to build a place where a community can gather, live, and flourish. This is just one mod out of a whole constellation of them that our modding community has woven from whole cloth, and the creator, Armatheg, has grown to help out the Freehold team directly as well. I'm going to take a sidebar here to uh, mention a thing that I was thinking about this morning, which is that if Dwarf Fortress has a roguelike mode, then Caves of Kud should have a fortress mode. <laughs> I think that would be really cool. Anyway. The hardest part of this talk was the curation process. This is just a handful of examples of the, cre the fan creations that have helped bridge the gap between game community and growth. And that's the end of my talk. I'm Ivy Melinda, community manager for Caves of Kud. You can find me on Twitter at underscore And remember, if Caves of Kud can motivate the community to learn and grow and support one another, Maybe yours can too. Thank you. All right. Well, that was wonderful continuing with the very motivational talks today. And uh, we have Ivy here to answer, uh, oops, sorry, some questions. Hello. Hello. I'm here with special guest Ava Problems. It's me. Special guest, Ava Problems. <laughs> Hello, special guest, Ava Problems. <laughs> Welcome to Rook Like Celebration. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. It was a wonderful talk. I, I really, yeah, I, I think it was interesting. I don't know if you could see chat, but um, a lot of people definitely went through similar experiences in terms of coming in through games like Adom. And so, yeah, it resonated with a lot of people. I'm I'm so glad. I, I was, like, hoping that, like, I wasn't just... Uh, you know, like doing some Babe Ruth sort of thing with that story. <laughs> no, no, lots of, <laughs> lots of people talk hinges around that experience. <laughs> yeah, but this is the place where I, I think many, many people uh, know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And yeah, so we do have some questions. So the first question is, uh, how does Caves of Cut team navigate the gray area of relying on volunteer moderators as a commercial project? Um, it's... Uh, it's opt-in. What can I say? Like, I, I feel like a lot of people feel very strongly about the community um, enough to want to be able to give back to it, but like they aren't sure how. So I think the more ways that we provide people um, to give back to the community, um, it's good for it's good for us. It's good for the community. It's good for those people that want to give back but don't know how. And I think that's like I think that's the real um, like core of that dynamic. Mm -hmm. that, that at least that's how I've been focusing on it. Right. I'm, I'm not in charge of payroll, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So take it up with someone else on Twitter. But it, it's good. I think that that's a a good point. Um, another question here I think is good. At what point in the game do you recommend playing with mods? And do you have any mods that are your favorites? Um. So I think I think. Uh, it depends on how much you care about like getting a quote-unquote authentic experience of Caves of Kud. 
Um, I tend not to play with a whole lot of mods because I want my experience to be similar enough to uh, an entry-level experience that I can still provide uh, meaningful guidance. Um, you know, like, there's there's so many mods out there, and uh, I, I feel like once you get a certain point into, like, you know, like, mucking around in the mods that... Um, like like the game can start to become unrecognizable from what it originally was and uh that kind of you know like for me that makes it hard to um sort of like tease out what like what i what information i need to like help new players to integrate into caves of code as a game and as a community that makes a lot of sense i think that's I a lot of chaos is mods um they're like uh, i play with your own personal relics right now um Same. It's, it's just uh Chaos is sort of uniquely positioned to um, be able to just sort of put this functionality into the game, and the mods are basically just like a toggle that <laughs> that like turn on um, interesting features that may or may not become implemented at any point. Um, your own personal relics gives a chance for like you know when you when you suddenly swell with inspiration to name your two faced nullworm skull um, like the commanding cap of Gritgate, uh, <laughs> then maybe it'll get. Maybe it'll make you start electric generation. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's excellent. And that makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, um, when people are developing a game too, there's that need to not get too involved in certain amounts of, of mods and ways removed from it because you've got to try and preserve that experience. So I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I see for people listening in the theater chat, people are, are name dropping some of their favorite mods. So. Yeah. There's, um, there's so many good mods out there. Just yeah. Lactabelle pet mod. Pet mod. Lactabelle. Carbide <laughs> chef. Character extraordinaire. She'll oh. bury you or she will carry you. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Another question. Can you remark on how key giveaways impacted the growth of the community? Um... That's, that's a really hard question to answer because, like... I don't really have, like, you know, like, the, the, the connections that get formed that way are sort of invisible. Like, I can I can look at the amount of keys that we've given away and the amount of, like, copies of uh, uh, Caves of Code that exist on Steam, for example, that haven't been purchased, but that doesn't really tell me about you know, like, the impact, you know, like, you can look at the stats, but there's so much more information behind those stats that, that, um, it's, it's not really actually possible to be privy to, at least from my position, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, like, it, it's not, um, I, I think I would have to, like, like, chase down every, you know, like, person that I have ever given a code to and be like, hey, have you ever, uh, <laughs> you know, like, convince anybody else to buy caves of could tell me all about your uh you know like uh volunteer marketing uh, for caves of could <laughs> and like i don't know like i i don't do that that's not uh that's that's not a thing yeah yeah <laughs> so i'm sorry but i can't really answer your <laughs> oh that's that's a fair question i mean obviously the answer is like nothing so drastic as to be noticeable <laughs> I, mean, I mean it could be but like <sighs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what one good question here that I think probably is the last question we'll have time for, even though it could probably potentially be long. But uh, what attracted you to be a community manager, and you know, what do you think makes games attract them? Um, I didn't really. Um, you know. Okay. So so here's the thing. I spent a lot of my time, you know, like like poor, not having a lot of opportunities, uh, no education, no training. Um, you know, like minimum wage jobs and all that. Um, I didn't feel like I had a lot of marketable skills to apply to, um, uh, you know, like, like quote unquote professional roles. Um, in as much as that means anything, but what ended up happening for me was I just sort of like lived my life and did my thing and I didn't choose to become a community manager, I, I was chosen to be a community manager. So I consider myself very lucky to have fallen into this position. And I am like eternally grateful to the people that are providing it to me. Yeah. I, 
I mean, I'm glad that you say that because I really think that to me, part of the joy of roguelike celebration is the fact that it's important that, you know, you and your work on the community of Caves of Cud is just as important as when we've had, you know, Brian or, or Jason or someone up here to talk about the development side. What makes a game is all of that working together. And so I think it's always been important and, and great thing about roguelike celebration to appreciate the fact that those are their own skill sets and are just as valuable as, you know, to use my own paradigm of like, you know, you got your wizards and your people who do the technical stuff and that's great and they get a lot of attention, but um, those rangery skills, the druids, like the, everything behind the scenes is just as important. So, <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. Thank you, special guest Ava Ramos for appearing as well. And uh, we'll see you around the con. Thank you.